I can hear me. So that's all. Wow, and you all shut up. Hey. You spin me right round, baby, right round? Right, Gabe? Right? Sweet. Okay, well, that's the unofficial start. Now the official start. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to B-Sides Nashville 2017. We're so glad you're here. Thank you. We know it's still a little early for y'all, but we've been here since six, so we're all wide awake and caffeinated and everything's ready to go. So, without further ado, here we go. B-Sides Nashville, what is it here for? We are here because we want to gather the people of information technology in Middle Tennessee and the region to educate and to get you to know each other. Not just to, you know, go to one talk, go to another talk, and then go back to your cubicle and do your thing. That's why we have the facilities that we have here. That's why we encourage you, yes, go to the talks, but then come out to the fourth track that is out there in the hallway. Talk to each other, get to know each other, shake hands, uh, find each other's Twitter handles, whatever it might be. Please, that is why we're here. We also have the fishbowl, which is our fun place over there. I'll talk a little bit more about later, but for now, the reason that we can do this is because of these folks right here. These are the sponsors, and we want to especially call out our platinum sponsors, Lipscomb University, four years in a row now. They have been the provider of these wonderful facilities, and I want to give them a big round of applause. Would you please? <laughs> also, Optive has been here, and they are wonderful. They are also a platinum sponsor. And Qualys is a gold and party sponsor. If you don't know about the party, the after party is going to be at the Poor House, which is downtown. We'll have a little bit more detail later, but they provide the money for not only this conference, but the fun we're going to have afterwards. <clears throat> uh, also, Sophos and Networks and CyberArk and SDG Glue, Sands, which has been awesome. They have stepped up and sponsored us, and they're going to bring more education to this region very soon. Uh, we're very happy about that. Security, uh, Premise Health, the ISSA of Middle Tennessee, Rapid7, AppSec, TrustedSec, and Adrian is here because of TrustedSec, Iron Geek. Thank you once again for all the recording you do. We really appreciate that service. Another round of applause for <laughs> And then our friends at No Starch. Hacker Boxes, which is the first one for this. We have a giveaway of a Hacker Box, which is really cool. We'll tell you more about that later. Sword and Shield and Defense Point Security, all sponsors. And we thank you all once more, please. Okay. Everyone who attended here, I'm sorry if I step away from the mic. I try to be loud enough. Everyone who attended here, you paid for a ticket, but that doesn't even cover the cost of lunch. The reason that we can throw this together and do it well every year with you know, shirts, badges, swag, food at lunch, party afterwards. Everything we do is because of these fine sponsors. And so please go out to the tables, shake hands, get to know their products, and we do appreciate that. Now, for organizational, the reason that Security B-Sides exists is because of a small team that founded it. Uh, where's Jack? Hey, Jack, I'm sorry. How many years ago was the first B-Sides? Excellent. So in this short term, how many have we had now, sir? 324 independent security conferences just because of that one organization. So obviously, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Jack, but would you please give a round of applause to Jack Daniel? He is <laughs> the driving force behind all of security B-sides, and he has done an awesome job, and we do appreciate that. Also, uh, we are here to support local organizations for information security and for the hacker community in general. And I'm going to do some call-outs. Is Brent here? Brent, you here yet? No, he hasn't checked in yet. Darn it. Okay. So that's DC615. They're a small community. They're trying to grow, and they're going to have uh, uh, – <clears throat> Brent is uh, going to be one of the uh, contact people. He's here. He's actually going to be giving a talk, Brent White. Uh, NASHSEC, Habers, where are you at? Hey, Lil. Hello, Lil. Say hey to the Habers when they're around. This is the NASHSEC community. They'll be happy to answer any questions about that. Um, ISSA Mid-TN. We have a representative? They're, oh, right. They're at their table because they're a sponsor, and we thank them. Um, and 
the uh, Nashville 2600. Uh, look for NSA Key and Ben the Meek in the fishbowl. Hey, Ben, sorry, I didn't see you back here. And they have set up the Unreal Tournament land so you can play against each other, and it's awesome as well. And speaking of the fishbowl, around the corner to the glassed-in area, past the bathrooms, take note, that's where the bathrooms are, is past there, you'll see the fishbowl. That is where we have uh, Minecraft uh, LAN that you can play against each other. There will be prizes, games, and there's Brent. Brent finally showed up. <laughs> Sorry, I was just talking about you, man. And um, we, we have the Unreal LAN. We also will have the Lockpicking Village. We will have a couple of 3D printers, courtesy of the East Chattanooga Makers. Makers. They are here. Thank you. Would you stand up, Ron? Sorry. And ladies, say hey. Hi. So thank you. Uh, we also, um, at some point, Trevor uh, Skydog will be here making badges and uh, hanging out, having a good time. He'll also be in that area. Um, we have a bunch of things to give away this day. And so, for the first giveaway of the day, who here traveled more than 100 miles to get here today? Raise your hand. Okay, 150. 200. 250. Four. 400 miles? Four, okay. Jack, I'm sorry, you don't win. I don't win. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> How many miles? How many? 500? You came with Amanda. So could you hold up the book that's in that bag? <laughs> it just so happens that it's a brand new copy of Amanda's Defensive Security Handbook. And there'll be more of those to give away during the day. At, at 1.30 today, lunch will be served starting at 12.30. We have a break until almost 2. The next set of talks start at 2. At 1.30, we gather back here in this room, the purple track, we'll be giving away a ton of stuff. And we have a little bit more details, but that's gonna be kind of our close because no one wants to hang around till 5.30 to see and give away and stuff. So everyone after lunch, we'll make an announcement, but just come back, back in here. Now, I wanna introduce our president. This is Lauren, and she has unicorns to share. We're an interesting group of people. And I'm short, give me one second here. Ah, there we go, can you hear me? So yes, these are all of our great people. We were very serious. Notice the upper left hand where we were doing our uh, signs. It's a great picture. So as far as giveaways, when we say we've got lots of stuff, we've got lots of stuff. Uh, a ton of Amanda's books. We've got books and book vouchers from No Starch. We have the Hacker Box. Uh, we have, thanks to SANS, two certificates to SANS Continuous Net Wars for four months. They're almost a $3,000 value. So, lots and lots of stuff. I probably should have gone through the slides first. Hey, look at that. <laughs> Notice Johnny. <Yeah. laughs> you gotta look at Johnny, he's only got half a face. <laughs> Sorry, let me. Yeah. You know, we Where's Hack for Kids? Next. Okay. There's your next slide. So go ahead and hit. Okay. Thank you. There we go. We, as always, uh, we are a nonprofit and we raise money for other nonprofits. So we pick various charities. Uh, this year, the charity that we picked that is not technology related is the Ovarian Cancer Research Fund Alliance because ovarian cancer has touched a number of us in our lives. So there are buckets on the desk to uh, donate money. And B-Sides Nashville will match any funds up to $500 out of our own pocket. The other one is the Rural Tech Fund. Sorry, my order was different. It's the Rural Technology Fund, Chris Sanders. That is his charity. He is doing a silent auction in the fishbowl, and he will give away those prizes at his talk, which is the last blue talk of the day. 
And the final one is a hack for kids. If you go to the Lockpick Village, they are doing a game challenge. It's a $2 minimum buy-in to play their game. And the winner has various prizes. I believe they have no starch books. So, okay. Uh, leave that up there. Somebody has to do the rules because Finn had to go off and have a family um, and do family stuff today. So I get to be the mean one. We are at Lipscomb University. They are a Church of Christ University. They have very strict rules. So I'm just gonna run them down for you. There is no drinking on campus. There is no smoking. That includes vaping. They want you to walk out to the street. Um, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> also, be very careful about the uh, words that you choose to use. And there are children running around as well. Um, the last rule is photos. Everybody wants to take pictures. That's great. Please make sure that the people in your frame give you permission to take their photo, especially if they're not somebody you know. Uh, now for all of our pretty pictures, thanks, Gabe. Uh, this is our participant map. Our two Southern Californians are speakers. That's why they didn't jump in. <laughs> um, so yeah, as you can see, we're mostly Middle T Tennessee and the Southeast, and we love all of the people who travel in for this, but we also love that we're able to get people in this area who don't normally come out to these things. We have a pretty wide swath of people. Yes, most of us are technology people, but there's other industries within technology. Healthcare, probably because we're Nashville. Um, the different levels that we have, a lot of individual contributors, some management, senior management, uh, C-level. Lots of students too, which is great. We want you here, thank you. Okay, before I do the next slide, how many people here, this is their first B-sets? Yeah. Thank you. Um, as you can see from this graph, almost 50% of our tickets, um, all of these numbers, by the way, are from the survey that you filled out when you got tickets. So the numbers are only as reliable as people who like to take surveys. But, uh, <laughs> There's your, yeah, 50%. Yay. So. It's a great picture. Um, as I said earlier, we had, it's, it's a small team of people who do this. There's about 10 of us. Uh, life happens. We all have jobs. We all have families. And this event wouldn't have happened without them, but we also can't continue it without help. We had over 100 people get on our wait list. More than 50 of them got told, I'm sorry. Uh, and we can't grow without help. So if you are in the area, if you think you can help, if you're like, I don't know what to do, the person who booked the after party had never done that before. The person who, the speaker dinner. Never, we need people to make phone calls. We need people to help us organize, just to answer questions, to come up with an idea, and then present it to the group. So if you are interested, uh, there is going to be a survey link on the website by some point today, and you can put in your information there and we'll contact you. Uh, we would love to have your help. Oh, and with help, we also need more sponsors. So if you wanna help with the money, please. Okay. Is Amanda here? There she is, okay. <laughs> I've been looking for you. <laughs> um, last couple of things. Uh, we mentioned the party, it's at the lunch break. As you guys are talking to each other, I'm going to warn you right now, parking at the party is in some ways as bad as last year, in some ways a little bit better than last year. It's pretty much valet only. I would strongly suggest you just take a ride. Um, they do have valet, there is no street parking in that part of town. Uh, if you get parked on the street, you will get towed. If you don't get hit first. So <laughs> you really don't want to do street parking there. Yeah, yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> um, lunch, if you've been to this B-Sides before, you know we normally sit outside because we have been very lucky the last four years. The weather has been beautiful. Uh, this year, not so much. Hopefully it won't be pouring. We just ask if you eat inside, if you go into a room, clean up after yourself. We have to leave this building as clean as we found it last night. Uh, and we hope that they let us come back year after year. So just think, keep that in mind, find a trash can. Okay, and with that, I guess I should introduce 
my favorite unicorn this week, and the only person I know who will wear a unicorn onesie with me, Amanda Berlin. Um, you may have seen Amanda at such events as Derby Con, Circle City Con, Gur Con, Def Con, and basically all of the cons where she likes to run around, talk, and tell everybody what she wants to, you know, what, whatever she's thinking. And uh, we gave her a platform today to do that. Oh, I forgot to do something. No. I'm sorry. I don't do this very often, as everybody knows who knows me. Um, where is it? No, I forgot to get with <laughs> I missed something, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I threw myself off. Amanda is an information security architect who has spent over a decade in different areas of technology and sectors providing infrastructure support, triage, and design. And with that, Amanda Berlin. Yay, thank you, Lauren. That's your laptop, right? It is. Really? <laughs> I don't, I, no, this does not pressure me. So did you the right direction? Did you lick the connector yeah, first? Blow on it. Yeah. Yes. Shake it. Well, stick it back in. Woo! Yeah. No heckling from the front row. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Is it? Can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. All right. Sweet. Well, first off, welcome to Nashville. Is everybody excited to be here? Yeah. Yay! Awesome. So this is my first keynote. I'm super excited. Thank you so much for the B-Sides Nashville organizers for inviting me to come out and speak. Um, so first I thought I'd start off with a little bit of a story um, about, gosh, now it's been like eight years ago or so. Um, my youngest son was one, my oldest son, which is back there, was seven at the time. Um, and I lived in a super shitty house in the middle of nowhere in Ohio. Now I live in a better house in the middle of nowhere in Ohio. Um, and I realized for the first time something was wrong with me, something more than the obvious. Um, I was progressively getting sadder and sadder throughout the day. And um, I was in the shower, and I had just recently gotten out getting ready for bed at night. And I like broke down. I started just bawling my eyes out on the floor of the bathroom. My husband ran in, he thought something was super wrong, that like I was leaving him or if I was dying or something, you know, super serious. About a half an hour later, I was finally calmed down enough to actually speak. Um, th this GIF is probably the best representation I can give of how I was feeling on the inside. My mind was static. Um, it physically hurt to try and speak. And this, this is exactly how I felt. Um, I don't like to use the word triggered unless I'm making fun of people, but um, <laughs> I can tell you the thing that tipped me over the edge or triggered me was that my shower curtain was dirty. Now, I felt so incredibly stupid and immature because that's not something that you should break down and have like a, like a physical breakdown about, right? Um, so looking back at all of it now, a lot of the anxiety problems that I had was uh, due to cleanliness. Right? It, I didn't have much control, of, you know, not going into too much personal detail, but I didn't have much control over the things that were happening in my life. Um, and even when I realized something was wrong, I didn't talk about it. I internalized everything and um, I figured, you know, at the ripe age of 25, I had been through so much I could take care of everything myself. <laughs> So why in the world am I bringing this up at an InfoSecCon? Um, first, I consider a lot of you like my family. You understand me more um, than a lot of people ever have in my life. 
Um, you understand each other. Um, when I began talking about my anxiety and depression problems to, you know, tweeting it, talking to people at conferences or whatever, um, I realized that a lot of people in InfoSec seem to struggle with the same kind of things. They just don't like to talk about it. Um, and not only that you're struggling with it, but you're trying to, you know, tackle everything on your own like I did for a good 10 years or so. Um, it's my goal to try and make it as public as possible and without stigma to be able to talk to whoever about it, whether it be a professional or, or one of us. Um, let's see here. So we never want to admit anything's wrong with us. Um, what's the first step of almost any 12-step program? Yeah, admit you have a problem, acceptance, right? Um, but not only do you have to admit that you have a problem, you have to admit to yourself that you need to do something about it. Otherwise, you're not going to get any further. You're just going to spiral deeper down into whatever problems that you're currently having. So not only do people in our industry have the normal stresses of like a nine to five job and family and, and stuff like that, but I feel like we have more stresses than a lot of other professions. Um, this is our passion. This is our hobby. I assume none of you are here because you have to be, because boy, would that suck. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> the InfoSec community is different than any, you know, any other. You're, you're driven, passionate, um, opinionated, uh, and, and when you put all of that together with, um, you know, even with some of the professions that we do, like incident response, or when you're dealing with child trafficking, you know, a, a lot of the professions that are out there have to deal with a lot of these sensitive subjects that tack on extra extra stress from all the other normal stuff that we do. Um, it also makes it, you know, the, the professions that we're in, uh, we're driven to those because we have the ability to stand or you know, sit behind a keyboard for hours on end without any human interaction. So I'm going to talk about some of the research I was able to do. Um, over the last several months, <laughs> I've read a lot of medical journals that were probably way over my head. Um, but I, I learned a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, so when I started searching for, you know, stuff to talk about, the first thing I did was I Googled uh, mental health issues in STEM fields. And there were six million articles that came up on Google. Four million had to do with women. <laughs> um, but 70% of our industry, or more, are men. So I thought that was a little interesting. Um, <coughs> I know the sexes are different when it comes to mental health issues. Um, women are more likely to be diagnosed with anxiety or depression, while men go towards like substance abuse or antisocial disorders. The hypothesis I was trying to prove is that, or try and find somebody else that had actually done the scientific research to prove, um, is that it seemed like people in STEM fields had a higher um, tendency to have mental health problems. Um, you know, if you look back in, back through history, there, there were a lot of extremely smart or extremely um, uh, creative people that struggled a lot with a range of mental health problems. Um, one that I found was the Savannah IQ interaction hypothesis, and it talks about two things. One thing, uh, the first thing it talked about was that uh, the higher intelligence that you have, the more likely you are to be either bipolar or depressed. So one of the, I want to read a quote from, it's a huge long medical paper, so I'm just going to read a, a couple sentences. Um, the finding of an association between progressively increasing risk of bipolar disorder and higher arithmetic intellectual performance is rather surprising. They explained that the arithmetic test requires not only mathematical skill, but rapid information processing for the purpose of successfully completing the timed exam. High scorers with such rapid processing power may also share tendency to experience mania, which is one of the halves of um, manic depression, uh, which is a state of high focus and high psychomotor activity. That, the second part of that uh, hypothesis talks about um, how people of higher intelligence are more likely to self-medicate. Um, and they, they did a lot of scientific research 
and, and went back, you know, th through the years looking at different things, you know, with medicating with booze, um, prescription drugs, non-prescription drugs, that kind of stuff. Um, it kind of shows you how, how many of you have watched Mr. Robot? All right, good. If you haven't, I'm not going to give you any spoilers. Um, but it shows how much uh, research that they kind of put in to that show because the main character, Elliot, self-prescribes a lot. Uh, he takes a, a, you know, a specific set of uh, a specific um, uh, measurement of morphine and then like counteracts it with Suboxone and, and does his own while I don't recommend doing any of that, <laughs> um, that's, you know, that's what they do in, in the TV show. And that's a good, that's a good gist of uh, at least half of that paper. So let's move on to some more st uh, statistics. Uh, not only does the Savannah IQ interaction hypothesis talk about this, <laughs> that, that's me, like, <laughs> I'll order another beer just to pick off more labels. <laughs> um, uh, the University of Berkeley uh, did a study that showed that 42 to 48 percent of STEM graduates suffer from depression. That's compared to 7 percent of the rest of the United States. This makes sense when you look at the Google results. It's not that you guys aren't having problems. I know a lot of you. <laughs> you, just, you just aren't talking about them or you're not, talk, you're not getting help from them. One in five adults experience mental illness. That's, that's an amazing, amazing percentage. Um, yeah. <laughs> so all of this, you know, one in five of us, right, if you look around. Um, and we think that everybody else has it together way better than we do. Uh, a lot of people talk about um, imposter syndrome which imposter syndrome is thinking that you shouldn't be doing what you're doing because you don't know enough or you don't have enough experience, kind of runs hand in hand with thinking everybody else has it together, right? You know, you, you think, you know, the person next to you, they're rocking it, they're super happy all the time, but that might not, not, that might not necessarily be true. Uh, this is definitely me. I'm one of the one in 25. Um, that's, that's had some, some part of my inner self completely screw up a major uh, activity in my life. Um, I found that the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommends that all adults be screened for depression. Um, when I read that, my mind went in a million different directions. I thought, all right, well, it's a U.S. You know, government telling us that, and... All right, so is it just everybody in the U.S. should be screened? Like, why is it just, why, why, why do they think that we all need screened? Is it, is it our diet? Is it our government? Is it, you know, what is it? Is it, um, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, we have it pretty good, right? Um, other, other countries, you know, obviously deal with a lot more than we do. Is it just like a first world problem, depression? But... That doesn't really matter when you're huddled in a corner or, you know, speeding your way down the highway thinking, oh, it'd be really easy to just swerve left. So I'm going to go into different types of mental health um, and some of the symptoms. I'm not going to go through everything because there's a million different mental health problems out there. I'm going to go through some of the more common ones. Um, and when I talk about the symptoms, don't just pay attention to like the shit going inside the brain. There's a lot of physical symptoms that manifest themselves when, when there's issues going on. Uh, first is social anxiety disorder or general anxiety disorder. Um, a lot of times they have the same symptoms. Uh, so some common symptoms, and I didn't memorize all these, so I'm going to have to read off my slides because there's a lot of different uh, symptoms. Uh, fear of situations where you might be judged. Uh, worrying about embarrassing or humiliating yourself. Concern that you'll offend someone. Intense fears of talking to others, like making phone calls. Um, fear of physical symptoms that might cause you embarrassment, such as flushing, stuttering, um, trembling, that kind of stuff. 
uh, avoiding situations where you might be the center of attention, like standing up front and on stage and talking to people. Uh, having anxiety and anticipation of a feared event, just like 20 minutes ago when I was <laughs> sitting up there. Um, spending time after a social situation, analyze, uh, analyzing your performance and identifying your flaws in your interactions. Expecting the worst possible outcome out of any social situation. Now you say to yourself, these might be things that you feel, you know, every now and then or whatever. But a lot of times in the symptoms, they talk about how it's an intense fear or it's something that you, you, you know, you're always thinking about and obsessing over. Um, I'm not a doctor, but if you experience any of these or any of the ones I'm going to talk about and you haven't gotten help, I'll also cover ways to do that. You might avoid normal social, social situations like using a public restroom, interacting with strangers, eating in front of others. I know I knew several people that I used to work with that could not, we had like a cafeteria, they couldn't go to the cafeteria and eat, they couldn't go to restaurants and eat. They got their food and they would go back to like what they considered their, you know, their safe spot on their desk or, or at home or whatever and eat. Uh, making eye contact, initiating conversations. Dating, dating's really fun when you have anxiety. Um, attending parties or social gatherings, going to work or school, entering a room where people are already seated, uh, returning items to a store. So I don't know how many relationships are ruined because of anxiety, um, and not just romantic relationships, right? But like friendships or any, anything that's above just like a business or acquaintance in a, um, a relationship. Um, I, I'll overinvest myself. I will overthink things. Um, I'll push people away because like in my mind, I feel like they're already gone. Um, I'm being too needy. I'm not attentive enough. I'm, my jokes are stupid. I'm too ugly. Like the list just goes on and on and on. And, it's, and, and none of it, like I realize none of it's um, based in any fact, but it, it doesn't make any difference. It's still there. And th that's, a, that's a common theme for people with anxiety is overthinking and being around people. So next up is a super fun one. Um, it's bipolar disorder, uh, previously known as manic depression. There's two sides of this one. First off is the manic part, where you're abnormally upbeat, jumpy, wired. You have an inflated um, uh, sense of self-confidence or um, well-being. You have a lot of energy, a lot of act you know, in increased activity, increased energy. And then the second part is the um, all the characteristics of your average depression. So depressed mood, mark loss of interest or feeling of no pleasure at all in things that you once gained pleasure out of. Um, you know, hobbies, work, you know, whatever, spending time with family. And another thing that bipolar people um, often have to deal with is poor decision making. So going on buying sprees, taking sexual risks, uh, gambling, um, lot, you know, and anything that's super compulsive. They also have insomnia, um, loss of energy, and this could all happen within the period of the day. Um, it could be longer periods where it's, you know, weeks at times, whatever, but it's, it's definitely a, a, like a light switch, turns on and off at, at random. Uh, next is borderline personality disorder. Uh, this is a mental health disorder that impacts the way you think and feel about yourself and others. So you can have um, feelings of intense, fe you have in in intense fear of, of abandonment. So for uh, people, loved ones or whatever, family. Um, you'll go to extreme measures to avoid the real separation or imagine separation. A pattern of unstable relationships will follow you. Um, because at once, one, one moment you'll idolize someone and think that you know, they're the best thing in the world, and the next minute um, you'll think they're out to get you or you know, they're, they're the worst person ever. You have rapid, rapid changes in self-identity and self-image that include shifting your goals and your values. So you know, one minute you might love your job and know you where you were gonna go in a career, and the next minute you'll just say, heck with it, quit, and go change and do something else. Also very super compulsive. You have periods of stress-related paranoia 
and you could lose contact with reality either for minutes or hours where you don't, you know, you, you have no idea afterwards what's happened. Um, you sabotage your own success by quitting jobs, ending relationships, suicidal threats is a common theme throughout all mental health <coughs> issues. Um, ongoing feelings of emptiness, inappropriate or intense anger, and violent outbursts. Uh, next is depression. It's one of the most talked about mental health issues out there. Um, people will associate a lot of times with just being sad about one thing in particular, but it's way more than just that. Uh, the World Health Organization recently did a study that um, depression is the leading cause of physical illness in the world. So a, it happens a lot. There's, it's, not, um, it's not something to just, you know, I mean, well, I joke about it all the time. But uh, So some of the symptoms of that are feeling of sadness, em emptiness or hopelessness, angry outbursts, irritability, or even over small matters loss of interest in, uh, or pleasure in almost all normal activities, sex, hobbies, sports, work, <coughs> sleep disturbances, um, and not just, uh, a lot of times you think of people with depression just sleeping too much, sometimes they suffer from uh, insomnia as well. Tiredness or lack of energy, so days at a time spent in bed or on the couch, just not wanting to get up and move anywhere. Anxiety usually goes in, you know, along with depression a lot. Slowed thinking, speaking, or body movements, and feeling of worthlessness or guilt, fixating on past failures, and overthinking things and blaming yourself for things that you're not responsible for. You have trouble thinking, concentrating, making decisions, uh, frequent or recurrent thoughts of death, suicide, attempting suicide, and unexplained physical problems, back aches, headaches, whole body aches, whatever. Uh, next is post-traumatic stress disorder. A lot of people associate this with being in active combat in the military, uh, but this doesn't necessarily just have to be that. Um, it's it's um, experiencing or, or witnessing any terrifying event that leaves a lasting impression. Um, they get recurrent, um, unwanting, unwanted, distressing memories that seem like they're, they're wherever they were when that traumatic thing happened. They'll relive the traumatic events. Um, upset, upsetting dreams or nightmares. <laughs> you wouldn't imagine how many funny images there are out there about depression. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I've, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Uh, those ones I couldn't put up here. <laughs> Severe emotional distress. Um, or physical reactions to something that happened to you or that you have witnessed during the traumatic event. And I think this is the last one, is OCD. Um, I read up a lot about OCD, and I just read some more last night, and I thought it was really interesting. So it's um, obsessive-compulsive disorder. It's a pattern of unreasonable thoughts and of fears, which are the obsessions, that lead you to do repetitive behaviors, which are the compulsions. Um, some of the... M a lot of people say they have OCD because, you know, they, they like their towels folded a certain way or, you know, they, they like to wash their hands after they go to the bathroom. Um, that's, that's not OCD. OCD is way more um, serious than that. Uh, I read uh, Nikolai Tesla actually had really bad OCD. He obsessed over the number three. Anytime that he wanted to go into a building, he would have a compulsion, and he would do it a lot of the times to circle the block three times before he could go into the building. Um, he had an intense fear of, round, of circular objects, uh, specifically women's jewelry. Uh, he would never eat alone with women because of this. <laughs> so it's, it's very limiting when you have OCD. Um, there are a couple other uh, serious cases of... Uh, I read one of this, of this lady, it was like a, a long time ago in France when they first started uh, researching all of this stuff. She had this intense fear that she was going to cheat on her husband, she was newly, newly married, cheat on her husband with everybody that she met. And this fear was so bad that you could walk up to her and tell her, you slept with me or you slept with him and she would instantly believe you. 
And she, she went so far as to you know, use physical means to make sure that it was only her husband that was being intimate with her. But it's uh, that kind of stuff that can really, really mess with your life. Um, a lot of times it's fear of contamination or dirt. Uh, there was a, several cases where there are people that fear that they've been contaminated so much that they will repeatedly wash themselves. They will not touch people. And I don't mean one or two times. Like two, three, four hundred times a day, they'll wash their hands or their body or enough that it's going to harm themselves. Uh, you could have aggress um, aggressive or horrific thoughts about harming yourselves or others that go completely against what you would normally ever do in life. Right? Thoughts that would never, ever cross your mind of ever doing always run through their heads, which is not, not fun when you're trying to go through your, uh, your everyday. So a lot of these tie together and you know, go on top of each other and you, you could have PTSD and depression and anxiety. And, you know, so we can all agree that having one or more of these would royally suck. Um, so now what? If you have one of these or someone you love has one of these or care about in your family or whatever, friends, um, what can you do to cope? Or how do you help them cope? I use vodka. No. <laughs> Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, many of you might have seen an impromptu survey that I had put out a while back. Uh, I asked about 20 different questions about your perception of mental health, uh, how it affects you in your life, that kind of stuff. I had over, over eight, almost 900 people answer it. And while I know I'm a big statistics nerd and I know how difficult it is to get a, a good sample of people answering survey questions, I still wanted to put it out there just to see what I could come up with. Um, this was one of the questions that I thought the uh, responses were interesting of. Uh, they, they, several people pointed out the fact that I kind of messed up the question format because I had asked, uh, let's see what it was, do you participate in any activities to reduce, dull, or improve the stress or feelings you're having, such as alcohol, prescription drugs, other drugs, exercise, meditation, or other? Um, I had put it out there as a multiple choice question when it should have been a multiple answer question <laughs> because when you cope, you might do more than one of these things. Um, and that was definitely the case. A lot of people put in the other category, all, <laughs> all of the above. Um, and that is kind of represented here. There's definitely more than you know the, the total amount here. Uh, I think my favorite out of the other category were pretend to be a Vulcan, <laughs> uh, masturbation, cats, and Twitter. <laughs> or cats and Twitter. <laughs> Guys on Twitter, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of different coping mechanisms that you can deal with. And I think 90% of the people that answered the survey were in InfoSec or some related branch of IT. And you can see that Savannah IQ hypothesis is working here. There's a lot of people using drugs and alcohol to cope. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine uh, after I had sent out the survey. He's uh, into InfoSec, but he also works in the mental health field. So I sent him my slides and everything that I wanted to talk about to kind of give him an idea of where I wanted to go and see if he could give me any good feedback. One of the things he let me know is that there are two things that you can do to majorly improve the chemicals in your brain. Anybody? Exercise. Exercise is one of them. Sleep. Keep going. <laughs> Sex. <laughs> but only if you're doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> then it's exercise, right? Get two for one. But as, as, a medical, as a medical mental health professional, he said that's what he tells his patients. So um, I use my mom as a sounding board for a lot of the research that I do, a lot of the things that I talk about. She's not very technical, but she likes to listen to you know, what I'm talking about and you know, kind of give me feedback from her, her, her point of view. Um, one of the things that she told me is, uh, when we started talking about different coping mechanisms, is that her great-grandma, um, when she went through menopause, was suffering from like sad and tired and withdrawn behavior. 
And at the time, they committed her and started giving her shock treatments. Because what's better than taking you out of clinical depression than shocking the hell out of you? Um, I, also, I also went to um, a field trip with my third grader. I go on a lot of field trips. Yeah, it was the third grader. <laughs> um, to a local county historical museum. And there they had a, an, I don't want to call it an insane asylum, um, but it was, it was basically like this huge halfway house that, you know, if you didn't have money to go to a nursing home or you didn't have parents or you were really sick or poor, everybody would just go here. It was a huge farm and you would work on it. And a lot of times they had mentally insane people there and they would send them to like this building that was just locked down and overlooked this nice hog pen. <laughs> um, and that's how they dealt with it, right? There was no other ways that, that they let them cope. There was a, um, a sign in the building. It was a, a quote from one of the people that used to work there. It was like in the, during World War I. Um, something about they let the crazies out to play today and it made a marked improvement on their general well-being and just the way that they talked about it was really super interesting. Um, so now we have way better ways of coping, right? Um, people talk about safe spaces when they make fun of millennials, but we don't need, we don't really need safe spaces, right? There are a couple people that do, but they're probably crazier than the rest of us. Um, but it's nice to go somewhere that you can talk to somebody openly about what you're experiencing or what you're doing day to day um, and not have them judge you back, right? Or, or spread rumors or whatever. Um, it can feel really good to externalize your feelings. Uh, a lot of the coping that I did without knowing it was coping when I was younger was write. I would either write down what was on my mind or I would write stories or I would just write anything. And it was really um, therapeutic and it, and it would help me cope without even knowing that's what I was doing. Um, so back, yeah, so back then you couldn't really talk about um, mental health issues. It was really taboo. Um, just like you couldn't, you couldn't talk about mental health, divorce, teen pregnancy. I've had all three. <laughs> um, and it's not, it's not as taboo to talk about anymore. You can ask for help. Um, through psychologists, therapists, whatever. And uh, something else that I wanted to point out is if you do happen to be interested or want to talk to a therapist or whatever, find one that works for you. I've, I've talked to a lot of different people throughout this whole thing um, that will find a therapist that they don't like talking to, they don't really click with. I've had some that find others that are like three states away that will do video conferences, which is great, especially for us that might not like to go out of the house. <laughs> so getting back to all, getting all doped up. Um, the last 20 years, we've seen a 400% per, increase in the use of antidepressants. Um, and it, it's an estimated one in 10 adults now taking them. So I don't want to, you don't ever want to devalue anybody's suffering, um, but you also don't want to throw medication at something where you might be able to use one of those other coping mechanisms to deal with anything that's happening in your life. So a good, a good amount of the things that we talked about uh, will increase your dopamine levels by you know, participating in the activity, just naturally, not without taking any medication. So when I was prescribed um, a medication for the first time I talked to my doctor, I was given Zoloft. Um, and this is kind of the explanation that he had given me, that it's a simple, it's a simple chemical imbalance in my brain that we could interact, uh, interact and, and correct with this, this simple chemical. You just take a pill every day, which in my mind made complete sense. You know, it's, it's just something chemical that they're interacting with, with another chemical, and everything would be fine after I took it. So I found out throughout my research that that's not necessarily 100% true. A lot of times um, the doctors really have no idea why some of these medications work. And I understand science is hard. Um, studies also pointed out that issues arise not only from the chemical imbalances in the brain, but genetic di disposition. Um, you could have you know, physical issues causing it. You could have um, other, uh, other medicine that you're taking causing it like as a side effect. 
uh, found in uh, American Psychological Association, Association article um, that kind of talks about this. Uh, they said, we do not dispute the possibility that neurotransmitters and other brain chemicals play a significant role on the etiology of depression. However, we are also concerned that the chemi chemical imbalance explanation may not reflect the full range of causes of depression, may be given greater credence by both consumers and practitioners than supported by some research, and or may be understood in an overly simplistic manner. But really, what, what kind of medical knowledge, unless you're in the medical field, do we get that isn't in an overly simplistic manner? I really think it's a way for the doctors to, to explain it without saying we don't know. <laughs> Um, because you don't ever want to hear that when you go into the doctor. Um, I started taking Zoloft about six months before the end of my divorce, and or the end of my marriage, sorry. The divorce took way longer. Um, <laughs> and it was great. I wasn't sad anymore. Um, I had a whole lot of energy, and it kind of also made me a zombie. Now, medication works differently for everybody just because of the different chemicals and the different genetics that you have and everything going on in your life everything works with somebody a different way so one you know Zoloft didn't work for me it might for somebody else that kind of thing um, but it made it I, I stayed on it for a couple years um, it made it really easy to propel myself through all of that um, the really stressful and tough times of my life all in all in six months, I got divorced, a new job, and I moved um, with three kids. So not having emotions was great. <laughs> um, if any of you have ever watched The Magicians, there's an episode that they use a spell to take all the emotions out so they can make sounder decisions. It's pretty much what it was like. So after those major stresses in my life had died down, I realized that it might be better uh, if I started feeling some emotion again. So I talked to my doctor again, and, um, uh, and I, I also, through a bit of self-reflection, realized that I might have been going down the same path, just in a differently medicated way, and I was filling my, you know, that hole in my life with way unhealthier things. Um, so I went back to the doctor and talked to him, and now I'm on... Uh, well, butrin with the occasional Xanax when I start freaking out. Um, I'm not saying everybody should be medicated, but I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people that cope in way unhealthier ways. Uh, so medication is definitely an option. Um, so now that we've covered a bunch of my personal baggage, we can talk about how we um, help others and how we treat others that might be in our lives that struggle with this kind of stuff. I try and talk about this stuff as openly as possible because um, I don't care. Like I, I don't mind talking with it and helping anybody that I can. Um, and when I have um, an anxiety attack now, I can verbalize it more than I used to be able to. The two most common things that I've heard, common negative things that I've heard, is one is you're overacting. And I'm not the only one that happens to, for sure. A lot of the people I've talked to get this, or they'll get um, the response that uh, it's their fault. I get this a lot. Um, and truly, I have so much going for me. I'm a published author. I have a you know, wonderful family. I'm gainfully employed. I'm fairly healthy. Like, What right do I have to be depressed ever? Um, but. You know what, hearing that, like, I've, I've, I've caught myself saying that to other people too. You know, if they open up to me about how they're feeling, I'll say, but, every, but we love you, you're great, everybody loves you. While that's not, it's not bad to hear, it doesn't necessarily help. Or two, I'll get maybe try thinking happier thoughts. Uh, I only wish that was possible. You can't just will yourself to be better if you have a chemical imbalance. Um, it can be really easy to put the happy face on on the outside, but that's, that's not changing anything on the inside. A good majority of mental health issues come with those physical symptoms, and if we treated them like physical symptoms, I think we'd get a lot further in life. Um, a lot of times we can't even see that kind of stuff ourselves. Uh, we need some, you know, a good support system. So let's cover the do-says. Uh, first, sometimes you just have to listen. 
It's really no more than that. Listening and good communication. Um, I, you know, talk, having signals, right? So I, I have a subset of people that I can talk to or, you know, give them a signal if I'm, if I'm struggling, right? It's like you can use a safe word for your mental health. I'll use, say, pineapple or whatever, right? And, and they'll know what to do to help me. Um, mine happen a lot at conferences, but towards the end, so it's not now, don't worry. Um, I personally think it's a combination of traveling. Um, you know, I work, I work at home alone all day long every day, and I have really no interaction with people. And then you're thrown into a three-day conference with, you know, a couple hundred, couple hundred thousand, whatever people, and that's, that's a, that's a huge shock, right, to the, to the brain, and um, mixed with lack of sleep because, you know, you party all night, sleep a couple hours, and then repeat. Bad diet. Um, a lot of times before I would forget to take my medicine and forget to take my vitamins and not exercise when I travel, and I don't make that mistake anymore. I sometimes skip the exercising and, you know, trade that off for a little bit more sleep, but uh, I no longer forget to take my vitamins and my medication because um, that just makes it happen so much quicker. Uh, secondly, another thing you have to understand is that interacting with others um, is difficult and they might just not feel like going out. The thought of crowds, enclosed spaces, dirty restrooms, um, loud noise, whatever the case may be, whatever they're, they're struggling with, um, is difficult to even fathom sometimes. Um, being crazy takes a huge toll on your social life. Uh, and sometimes there's nothing you can do to help. But having that open communication with them um, and, and knowing what to do when you can help really makes a difference. Uh, there's a great article that a friend of mine sent me. Um, we were talking um, about his anxiety problems that he was dealing with. Uh, and it's called, this is how you love someone with, this is how you love someone with anxiety. <clears throat> a lot of the points were spot on, but like in different ways for each of us, because we both have different, um, different ways that it affects our lives. Um, my favorite quote was, uh, silence kills anyone with anxiety. It creates problems in their mind that aren't even there. It ends in apologies that aren't even needed. And that part pretty much describes me to a T. Um, they talk about texting, like if you, if you text the person and, or you know, if somebody texts me and they, they don't respond, especially like if I've recently opened up about something as opposed to just sending memes, uh, it, you know, the, the thoughts just spiral. And then I, at the time you realize that's not all logical, just like talking about the people with OCD. In, in the studies and, and observing them, they realized that none of it was logical and none of it was, it was not based on any fact whatsoever. They knew it was stupid, but it doesn't matter. It still happens. Um, and the last thing is the, the phrase, it's okay, or asking how I can help can never be used enough, and nothing beats a blanket for it. <laughs> uh, not only have I gotten both the positive and negative reactions about mental health, but almost everyone I've talked to um, in the last few years, when they talk about it, people have been surprised. You know, they're funny, they're outgoing, um, you know, they, they have all this stuff together and every, people are surprised when they, when they open up and talk about it um, or they've been shamed in thinking it's their fault. So while it's, not even, while it's not even easy to talk about in the beginning, you have all of those other things on top of it that make you want to bottle it up and like force it to go away. <clears throat> So I wanna show you, talk to you about a few things our community is doing. Uh, one of them is ironin.com. It's I-R-0-N-I-N.com. And it has, uh, it talks about semicolon project, which, which has to do with mental health. Um, and a lot of things industry specific that we can do, um, or, you know, starting in the industry, you know, that, that, those kind of resources. And the second one's this video from Movix. Um, one of my favorite people in the whole world, and he, t he talks a little bit about this kind of thing. All right, here it is. Yes. Hi, 
I'm in job mode, and I'm happy. Now, every single one of you watching probably has a different definition of what that might be. But I guarantee not a single one of those definitions includes race, creed, color, religion, sexual preference, or anything in between. The Hacker community is filled with human beings, people from all walks of life. In our community, like any social community, there are people among us, friends, acquaintances, somebody that have problems that many of you might not even know they have. We have lost too many of those friends to suicide, drugs, alcohol, depression, and crime. Many of us dove into the world of computers and the internet because it was a place of acceptance. But there's a dark side to this world. It is too easy to disconnect. To miss those markers where all you see is what someone treats or others. You can't see when you hurt when you cry. There are many ways to help us that need it and are afraid to ask because one of the biggest biases that we don't have in our community is showing weakness. But you can let those around you know you care, that you are there for them, and the door is open to talk anytime. But one of the best ways is just to be around each other. Hang out, go to a movie, have a good time, talk about your day. To be a true friend, not just another face in a lobby of a conference. If you wish to join me in this fight, please make a video. Or just tell your friends, your con buddies, or your acquaintances that you just see at that lobby conference that we are all hacking together. So that guy's great. He's a super badass USMC vet, um, and he can talk about this stuff openly, so I feel like all of us should be able to. Um, so let's do some hacking together. Uh, my phone, my DMs, my door, whatever, are always open for anybody else to talk to me. Um, a lot of times when I'm feeling lonely, because like I said, I live in the middle of nowhere, Ohio, disconnected, whatever, I'll like tweet out um, uh, a Google video link, whatever, to talk to whoever, you know, Twitter followers, my friends that live, you know, all the way across the country, talk to them about what they're working on, day-to-day um, -day stuff, how, how things are going in their family, just mess around, whatever. Um, my kids get on and say hello to all my internet friends. <laughs> um, so there's so many, so many or, um, resources that you have. You have resources in here, you have resources um, nationwide that you can use. Um, I think going back to the survey, I didn't, I didn't want to like spam you with like a million survey results because I figured that would be super boring. Um, but I think the saddest part of the survey were two, two of the questions. One of them was, have you ever felt like you weren't worth much as a person? Over 50% of people answered yes. And over 40% said they thought their life wasn't worthwhile. Um, I feel like having more of an open dialogue about this um, would kill it as a taboo thing to talk about. So... <laughs> I almost got all the way to the end, too. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, even if you don't like each other, like Rob said, a life is a life, and we've already lost too many. Uh, here are some amazing nationwide organizations that you can call or text. You know, a lot of us don't like talking on the phone, right? Some of these places you can go online and chat, um, so you don't necessarily have to call them on the phone. Super qualified people on the end of the line that deal with this stuff every day. They can talk you through whatever you're working, uh, you know, working through. Or, or whatever you want, if you think you have nowhere else to go. Finish up, I wanted to put a picture of a puppy up here because I realized how depressing this might be. <laughs> um, and to recap three things that you should remember. One is that you're never alone. Um, two, get help if you need it. There's always options out there from people sitting next to you to someone that you can call that's a professional. And three, be compassionate to others and communicate. We all had our struggles in life, some more than others, uh, but you never know what's going on in someone else's mind. <sighs> so thank you for listening. That's it. <laughs>
Yeah, I'm all done. Thank wow. you so much. Give her another round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. And